Good morning. morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor, and you can just call me Gene. People have called me worse. I'll get another joke to open up with later. It's okay. So if you've been here for a while, you know that I'm a big fan of history. I like history. I like historical stories, but if you know anything about the Bible, you know that it's history, his story. And so these are historical accounts that we're constantly looking at. And I've had people come up to me and say, you know, I'd really like to be a pastor, really. And they say, but I don't like to read. That's going to be a big problem. <laughs> so a good teaching pastor is a history buff. They like their history. We like to read a lot. We get enthusiastic about it. And sometimes I like to open up with stories. And sometimes they're clearly like nonfiction or fiction. Sometimes they're like about me doing dumb things as a kid. But sometimes I give you like a real historical story. We got close last week. The Lusitania, right? So we went back to 1915. Today, we're going to do a real historical story. We're going to go back a little bit further, so like the mid-1800s-ish, so somewhere between, I think, 1861 and 65, so you got to be able to remember all these dates when you're doing this stuff. But anyway, that's not the point. We're going to go back to the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. We're going to go back there. Now, even though Lincoln was a really good president, he still had his detractors. He had people, as we would say today, talking smack about him all the time. Well, that's kind of interesting because we don't remember him like that. We remember him really, really great. And now I'm going to do a side note because politics. <laughs> people will say that it's worse now than it has ever been. Like the rhetoric is dialed up like to 11, right? If you're on a Marshall half stack, the musicians are laughing now, but no one's laughing. So anyway, we're just dialed up with the rhetoric. It's red hot. It's crazier than it's ever been. Anyone who says that to me does not know their history, <laughs> right? Because we've seen in the Old Testament, it's pretty crazy in there. So it's always been really, really crazy. And here's the thing, going back in our political history, they would do something. Like if you talked enough smack about someone, here's what would happen sometimes. The person would challenge you to a duel. <laughs> right? So if you're in the right time, that means we're going to take like 10 paces, turn around, and just shoot one another. That was a thing. Now, I know what your twisted minds are already thinking. We should bring it back. <laughs> right? It would solve a lot of problems, but not for me. Because it would just give me one more thing to minister you out of, right? <laughs> so let's not do that. But, you know, people would put their money or the bullets where their mouths are. So Hamilton, was it Burr and Hamilton, I was reminded? That was a duel, right? So it happened. Now, different thing with Lincoln. He had a detractor named Edwin Stanton. And this guy was horrible. He made fun of Lincoln's intelligence, and he was a smart guy, so there's really nothing to make fun of. And his appearance, if you've seen like the old photographs of him and stuff like that, you know, he's not going to be on the GQ magazine or whatever it is anytime soon. But he made fun of him. He called him a clown. He called him a gorilla. It was horrible, horrible stuff going on back then. So what did Lincoln do? Well... He didn't repay evil for evil. He said nothing about it. He didn't argue with him. He didn't dignify it with a response. He stayed calm when insulted. But here's what he did do. <laughs> he appointed Stanton as his war minister. What better man for the job? Clearly, he was belligerent. So <laughs> go ahead. Do your thing. Just do it on somebody else right now key position. But here's the thing. Although it wasn't a duel, Abraham Lincoln died by assassination, if you know your history. As he lay there dying, Stanton was in proximity. So he's looking over Abraham Lincoln's dying body. He's about to die. And he says this, 
There lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. Amazing. The patience of love had conquered in the end. Today we're going to talk about patience. We find ourselves in the rest of the story. And if you're new to this, is where we're looking at the full counsel of God's Word. This is the program guide here at C3 Church. We don't run on anything else, just this. That's it. It's important for you to know. So if you don't like that, <laughs> you're not going to like it here because we do a lot of scriptures, right? I let God do the talking, right? And then Gene tells the jokes. That's it, right? So <laughs> it kind of warm you up for this. Once we get there, it gets a little bit harder, deep. So anyway, we're looking at, they had like their civil war, right? We saw Israel in the north, Judah in the south, and then there's all these different kings. Finally, Israel falls. They're out of the picture for now, and now we're dealing with the kings of the south and Judah. And so we're getting more and more rapid here, and we're down to the last three kings. And so we're taking a look at them carefully. We are reinserting the prophets in these accounts where they belong. A lot of people don't know this. You have to kind of chop up Jeremiah and put them all over the place to get it right. It's not chronological. The books of the Bible are not chronological, so I am chronologicaling them for you. I'm kind of putting them back in order. And it's interesting because a lot of longtime Christians didn't even know the last week's account that just the first three chapters of Daniel were right in there during Jehoiakim's time. We know that they all got taken away. We got the who, what, when, where, why to Babylon. So really enriching. Right? Gives it a lot of flavor. So speaking of prophets weaving through, we're going to look at another one. And this one's kind of tough uh, to place, and it's also a tough name to say. Habakkuk or Habakkuk. Now, here's the funny thing. I listened to the rabbi on my smartphone say it, and I'm not going to try to do it. <laughs> but nobody's saying it right in America. Right? So the funniest thing is to watch people argue about how it's pronounced, and it's totally wrong. Like, they're both wrong. And indeed, this is the crux of pastoral counseling. I'm just watching a couple people argue about who's wronger. So here's what we're going to do. I'll make you a deal. We won't be like snooty about how to pronounce the name. So you can say tomato, tomato, Habakkuk, Habakkuk. Doesn't matter. Do we know who we're talking about? Yes. Okay, moving on. So the timeline's a little difficult here because the crux of Habakkuk, Habakkuk, is that he's seeing this impending invasion of the Babylonians. But the problem, besides the invasion, is that it happens like three times. So we don't know which one he's talking about because he does not grace us with the name of the king who's in power at that time. It doesn't begin there. So we have to kind of guess. So scholars will be like, it could be here. It could be over here. It could be over here. So we're placing it here because it was cozy for my sermon planning. That's the only real reason. All right, so there's going to be another invasion and then another invasion. And so he's seeing this on the horizon. So it's somewhere around this time we get the book of Habakkuk. So I'll jump right in. Habakkuk 1.1. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry. But you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. I feel you, bro. <laughs> right? Sound familiar? So yeah, history repeats itself, right? So here's the crux of the book of oh, Habakkuk. I got to stop saying that. It's too much fun. So the crux here is that it's going to be like, and some versions will say complaint, and yeah, yeah, but not the way we complain. So Habakkuk will have a complaint, and the Lord will have an answer. Then he'll have a complaint, and the Lord will have an answer. None of these answers are really great. And so then Habakkuk will praise him, though, in the midst of this. So he's absolutely nothing like us. So when people look at this and they're like, we can complain because he did. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> That's not happening to you, and you're not, like, worshiping like that. So let's look at it. So the Lord replies, Habakkuk 1.5, the Lord replied, 
Look around at the nations, look and be amazed, for I'm doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. I'm raising up the Babylonians, side note, may say Chaldeans there, for argument's sake this morning, they're the same people. Moving on. A cruel and violent people, they will march across the world and conquer other lands. So, note, the Lord is sending the Babylonians, so we know why, right? These are wicked People, So the people of Judah and Israel, the Israelites, synonymous, bad. They're doing really bad things. Not only, it's not like they're just worshiping other gods. A process of that worship is killing their own children. So let's just, you know, the God of the Old Testament is really mean <laughs> to people who kill their own children. And so they're sacrificing their own kids to other gods. So it's not like he's just some simply jealous God, right? You're, you're doing wrong. So he uses, he raises up King Nebuchadnezzar and all different kinds of people. We saw Pharaoh Nico before to go punish them. They're being rightly punished. So just keep that in mind. But he describes these people. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs. The eagles swoop down. So there's just a lot of this poetic type of imagery going on. They're bent on violence. We get to a key verse, Habakkuk 111. They sweep past like the wind and are gone, but they are deeply guilty for their own strength is their God. Put that one in your pocket. All right? So they're deeply, their own strength is their God. Habakkuk, second complaint, 112. O Lord my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you do not plan to wipe us out? O Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins, but you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow a people more righteous than they? So he does not like it, and he's appealing. So everyone from him all the way back to Moses will often appear to the Lord. Right? So regarding other nations, right? You know, will you let them conquer the Egyptians, them conquer us? It's going to make you look bad. They're going to say, the Lord turned his back on his people. So it's an appeal. We see this all over the place in the Bible. Surely you wouldn't do that. So it's a complaint. He's trying to negotiate a little bit with the Lord. And he says, basically, there's, there, there's a few issues here. What's going on is <clears throat> they're going to brag. We're like fish caught in nets, he'll say. And they're going to make the nets their gods and say the nets did it, right? So he's trying to make all these different appeals. And now we get like a really awkward chapter break. There are no numbers in the originals. It didn't happen for hundreds of years. So sometimes I question the choices here. <laughs> and here's another place where I question it because he's still talking. So it kind of like interrupts him. So like at a Bible study, we just do one chapter and we stop and then it's weird, right? Shouldn't do it like that. Read the whole book. Habakkuk 2, 1, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. <clears throat> Habakkuk 2, 2, then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This is a vision for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. Hang on to this. If it seems slow in coming, Wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by faithfulness, their faithfulness to God. So here is the summary. They are trusting in their own wealth, their own creation. So back then, maybe you saw Gladiator. Do you remember Russell Crowe? He carries around these little wooden things of his family or whatever, right? Those are his idols. And so they would make these idols, and the Bible goes on and on all over the place about it. This is foolish. You're worshiping these pieces of wood that you made. So they did that back then. It was a thing, right? So they trust in the idols. They trust in their wealth. They trust in their own strength. And so he's going to go through each one of these three things making it clear what sorrow awaits you who build these big houses with money gained dishonestly. You believe your wealth will buy security, putting your family's nest beyond the reach of danger. If you continue on, has not the Lord of heaven's armies promised that the wealth of nations will turn to ashes? Important to keep in mind God's words. What good is an idol card by man or a cast image that deceives you? How foolish to trust in your own creation. A God that can't even talk. If you read the prophets a lot, they often mock people for being dumb for doing this. 
So it's going to happen, and then Habakkuk sings a song. So think of Habakkuk chapter 3 like a psalm. It's kind of like that. This prayer was sung by the prophet Habakkuk. I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. He continues on, but the conclusion is, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer. Kind of sounds familiar too. It's psalmish. Able to tread upon the heights. And it says, it's for the choir director to be accompanied by string instruments. It would be cool if I got someone like play a harp the whole time I talked or not. So, <laughs> so sometimes we feel like Habakkuk, don't we? We see some kind of impending disaster. And maybe... Like Paul, we got a thorn in our side for a reason, right? Keep you from being proud is what it says. Paul, three times I asked, my grace is sufficient for you. So Habakkuk's in that same spot, and we don't like it. We feel like he's not listening or he's not responding. Why? What's going on? Here's the thing, Habakkuk 2.3. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. In Habakkuk, we see kind of a really good biblical pattern here. We're in distress. There's something wrong or something we don't like. So what do we do? We're supposed to pray and keep praying. And be patient, and be patient. Then, future restoration. Now, we've talked about this. Where? Not here. <laughs> Heaven. I won't get there. I'll show you the scriptures. So sometimes it's not always perfect. Sometimes. It's not perfect here. <laughs> it's not going to be. The Bible calls the world evil. <laughs> it's bad. The devil is the prince of this world, the ruler of this world. And if you're watching the news like me, you can kind of tell that's true. Now, here's the thing. In this process of distress, the process of distress, what are we supposed to do? Well, we looked at it, right? Pray. But what should we be, like, physically doing? We're going to go to Romans, Romans 12. So you've got to flip further ahead, right? So take a look at this, Romans 12. So, very quickly, the, the point of Romans, and here's where I can, so I'll be careful. <laughs> the point of Romans is to stop disunity in the church. So, Paul did not sit down and go, I'm going to write the greatest theological work ever written. Ding! You know, and then God said, thorn in the side, calm down. No. He, they're all arguing with one another. The Jews and the Gentile Christians are going at it. So, Paul goes at them. Yes, the Gentiles have sinned. But you Jews, you've sinned too. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, an example of Abraham's faith. That's how we are saved. Five through seven, Adam and Christ contrasted. No, you should not go in sinning all the time. Paul's making fun of Adam. <laughs> Chapter eight, a new life in the Holy Spirit. We, don't, we are not slaves to our sin. That's six and eight there. Nine through 11, what happens to Paul's kinsmen who didn't accept Christ? That's what that's all about. We get to 12, and so... Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. In this process of distress, don't be anything like the world. Your version may say, a little more complicated, I use easier versions because I don't know the reading level of people in here. All right, so the point here is not to show off, the point here is to teach you. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. I think we might all understand that. Right? So don't be like it, be different, be like God. Don't go there for answers in distress. 
Don't go there for answers in distress. Don't trust in any of that. Don't be conformed to anything in the world. Change the way you think. Be transformed. And furthermore, be a sacrifice. Do not kill yourself. Be a living sacrifice. It means sacrificial love. It means sacrificial love. Could mean sacrificing yourself for someone else. No greater love anyone has than this, I know, but sacrificial love in this context. So all you Paul dealt with <laughs> that whole time, stop it. Love one another. Be really nice to one another. That's how you do it. Someone comes at you hard, you just love them. That's what real worship is. A little bit of a tangent here. <clears throat> it's a good reminder, those of you who know about the culture we're building in this church, a biblical Christ-centered culture, only none of the extras. I really don't like them. I find them distracting. And so we here at C3, if you've been here for a while, you know what worship is. I'm going to use somebody else's words because they're hard ones. A.W. Tozer. A lot of people are like, oh, I like him. Yeah, <laughs> he's tough. Christians don't lie. They just go to church and sing them. Yeah. Right, so what is worship? The Bible defines worship as sacrificial living. It's love. That's worship. You need to rethink Worship, right? It's all great, like, meme. You know, it's a woman, you know, the woman kind of you know, crying on Jesus' feet and drying it with her hair. There's a woman in distress at Jesus' feet. This is worship. Yes. Yes. The singing is just an extension of it. So, yo, yeah, oh, but Gene, the Psalms. Yeah, take a look at them again. It's an extension of that sacrificial living. Are we living sacrificially? So people will point to Habakkuk, right? <laughs> wow, he was kind of complaining and then singing it right. Is there like an onslaught of Babylonians coming? And we're going to get into it. Jeremiah, Lamentations, it's going to cause them and these sieges to eat their own children, resort to cannibalism. So the guy's a prophet. You might see that coming. That's not us in the A.C., Right? So, but yet, Christians come and complain. What? Right? So they'll complain about the worship, which is like kind of crazy. <laughs> How can you do that? Because it's sacrificial living. These are singers. Right? So when we're doing this, we're just singing. It's not the real worship. It's an extension. So understand that. Most people don't want to admit that, look at that, but that's what the Bible says. It's up on the screen still for a reason. This is your worship, just loving one another sacrificially. So check it out. This is how important it is, Romans 12, 9. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. This is what we are to do in this process of distress. Simple formula. Patience. Pray and love, love, love always. Always. Everyone. Now, let's look at in this process of distress what we are not <laughs> supposed to do. Because Paul's going to cover it. So here's what we're not supposed to do. Because let's say... We got oppressors like Habakkuk. You know, we got our Nebuchadnezzar are coming at us. And part of that distress is like for Paul, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. We, we have someone in our lives that's like that or a group of people, whatever it is. We have an oppressor. So now I want you to imagine, imagine that. It's not just something. It's someone or some group of people because this is usually kind of what it is. Picture that person. Here's the thing. Keep this in mind. There is nothing we can do to that person in revenge or retaliation that is greater than what God's going to do to them. And so just frame this. I'll get back to this in a second. Habakkuk 111. Let's remember. They sweep past like the wind and are gone, but they're deeply guilty for their own strength is their God. They're going to get it. Don't worry. Yet, 
here's a problem, and I want to discuss this. This is the strength of their own arrogance, them, right? So the strength of, their strength is their God, sorry, jumbled that up. Them, we must not be like them and get arrogant. Right? What are we going to do? This is what people will come in and say, and I'm like, do you read your Bible? So something will happen, and it's like blown up in the news, right? Or these people are going to websites you should not be going to because it's like melting your mind. And they come in here looking nothing like a joyful Christian. <laughs> it's okay to weep. We weep with those who weep. We're going to see that. That's not what I'm talking about. They're red in the face, saucer-eyed, and angry. That's not of God. That's a fruit of the flesh. We'll get to those. All right? And they're like, what are we going to do, Pastor Gene? What? What do you mean, what are we going to do? Love everybody? <laughs> Even our enemies, like it says? I don't know. But they want the other answer. You're not going to get it here. What are we going to do? It's arrogance, like those in Habakkuk, people who trust their own strength, people who trust their own wealth, people who trust their own creation. And they shouldn't because... Habakkuk 2.13, has not the Lord of heaven's armies promised that the wealth of nations will turn to ashes? Gone. Remember, I tell history stories. We're a pretty young country. Think about it. They should not. We shouldn't trust in anything but God. That's it. He is the only one who will never disappoint. Everyone else will. Every institution created by man will turn to ashes. God will melt the earth. We're going to get that there. He will. He's going to bring everything to nothing and then bring us into his new heaven and new earth. We need to keep that in mind at all times. So here's the thing. What are we going to do? Well, if we are in God and God's in us, then we will, Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never. Pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, again, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. He handles that anger a lot better than we do. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back. Deuteronomy 32 says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Proverbs 25, quote, Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. These people that have bought into all the political nonsense, they have been conquered by evil. It is sad. It is sad. It brings me tears to see what has happened to some of these people. Instead of just saying, you know what? <laughs> this is crazy. I'm going to pick this up, and I'm just going to wash myself with the word. I'm going to clean myself out of all this garbage. They get hyper-invested in that. It's a trap. It's a trap. What I'm saying here is the truth. It is God's word. That's a trap. The devil got you. It's so bad. We shouldn't be talking about these things in church. What, what does it say? We, loving one another. You need your feet washed? I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. But we're not hearing that enough, are we? These people have been conquered by evil. When you take revenge, when you retaliate, we're going to see, pay insult for insult, Evil wins. Evil wins when you do that. You can't. We need to conquer evil by doing good. If we turn the page, we see this. Nobody likes this, but just bear with me. I'll explain. Romans 13.1, everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. 
So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you're doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They're God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. You must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes, too. For these same reasons, for the government, workers need to be paid, excuse me. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Now listen, there's going to be a, but, but what if, but what if, right? That's what always is great. I've had office meetings about this section of scripture. <laughs> it's amazing. Like just the lawyers all of a sudden that everybody turns into. You're Christians, not lawyers. So maybe you're lawyers. Okay, you can be a Christian and a lawyer. We'll talk about that later. Insulting people now. But anyway, but, 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 there's no but. There's no but. It's not there. It's not there. You got to go back before the but and say, why did you ask but? Check your heart. Where is it at? I'm going to give you some reasoning, though, because when we look to the full counsel of God's word, we, we see what and why. But think about Habakkuk, right? Complaining, right? But what? They're attacking me. God's like, I sent them. You just sit and wait. Think about it. Think about it. But what if, what if they're wrong? I'll take care of that, God says. I'll, I'm the judge. So, God's words, not mine. mine. <laughs> that was a Jewish mine. Uh, no, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> first Peter. It's in First Peter. So, it talks a lot about suffering, right? And taking it. It's in there. Really redundant. First Peter 2.13. For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as the head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. Or your version might say emperor because Nero is about to be burning Christians alive. Yet honor him. Respect everyone. Your love and honorable deeds, even if it means death, yes, the Bible says that, it will silence them. But here's the thing. But, but what if we're being wronged? What if they're wrong and we're right? What if? Oh, I'm glad you asked. You mean like Jesus was wronged and he was right? We're going to be better than him now? Well, check this out, 1 Peter 2, 18. You who are slaves, let's just say employees in this context, submit to your employers or masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they're cruel. For God is pleased when conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Not going to be the verse of the day. Watch, it will be tomorrow and I'll be wrong. For God is pleased, and I'd like that. For God is pleased when, conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, ah, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. You must be like him. Christian means baby Christ. He never sinned nor deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. Imagine that. Called to do good, even if it means suffering, even if it's unjust. God is pleased when we overcome with love. Prove it, right? You can love when it's easy. Anybody can do that. How about when it's hard? Now we're going to see. That's the real test of your Christian love. 
Let someone wrong you, and then you still just love them. Prove it. That's what the Bible says, too. So we can keep going. Examples. Jesus is our example. He did not retaliate. Again, what are we going to do? What Jesus did. Nothing. Just love. That's the answer. You see, it says, God will judge. He will. That's why Jesus says, Luke 12, 14, Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more to you after that. But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he is the one to fear. So, we are to wait on the Lord. Let him do it. There's nothing we can do that's going to be any more just, righteous, or horrible than what he can do. Again, it may seem slow, but let's look at this again. Habakkuk 2.3 is vision for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. We must be faithful and patient, and this means obeying his commands, not our own ideas. We must not be arrogant. We must not be proud. We must not trust in ourselves. We must not trust in anything in the world. We must not trust especially in our wealth. And we need to wait concerning retaliation, revenge, judgment. That's his job, and he's a whole lot better at it. Leave it to him. So here's the thing. We're going to close soon, but I just want to talk about God's timing. Second Peter. If we get to Second Peter, you have mockers and oppressors during this process that we're going through. But Second Peter 3.5 says, They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out, of, out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood, Noah. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything in it will be found to deserve judgment. So, as stated in Romans, here's something that a lot of people don't think about. We get selfish. So if you know that, this is horrible. Eternal fire. Earth's going to be gone. This is horrible, the fate that awaits these people who are not saved. So what did it say in Romans that we're supposed to do for these people? Our enemies, bless them. Pray for them. You see, if our hearts are right and we are in Christ and we know the full counsel of his word, we should be pitying these people. Pitying these people. This is going to be bad, like really, really bad. Imagine your enemy in the fire forever. That's not good. And so we should have mercy, like they're children challenging us to a fight. <laughs> Whoa, you're going to hurt yourself. You feel sorry for them. They're ignorant. They've turned their backs on God. It's not good. So we are commanded, that's what that is in the Bible, command, to pray and pray to bless them. <laughs> Think about that. Don't just pray, like, yeah, you know, I hope they come to Jesus and then we can, like, you know, have coffee. No. Bless them with the coffee. We do that here, too. You'll hear about it later. So bless them, right? So if it's someone at work that hates you and whatever, they want to take your job even or something horrible like that, bring them coffee. What? Right? Don't, like dump it on their head. Well, the Bible said that. No, it will be alike. <laughs> right? Don't do that. That's not good. Right? So there we go. A little joke in there. You guys were getting a little serious. So this is my encouragement to those 
who are oppressed. And so I want to pick up where we left off and we ended last week, and then we'll end here in Hebrews. Hebrews is like the greatest commentary on the Old Testament ever in the New Testament. It talks a lot about go, not going back to the old, like, Jewish religion, but being in Christ. So Jesus is superior to everything. And we looked at this when we were talking about being on fire for the Lord. Like, we started a certain way, or maybe we're into fad Christianity, but we're not willing to go in the fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? So we're not willing to do that. So we talked about being on fire. And this is what the author or preacher of Hebrews is saying to them. Look, you've got to stay on fire for the Lord. But what I want to do is I want to go one verse back and then forward, and we're going to see a beautiful end capping on today's theme. Hebrews 10.30. For we know the one who said... I will take revenge. I will pay them back. He also said, the Lord will judge his own people. Something to keep in mind. Deuteronomy 32. It is a terrible thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and you were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken away from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. Are we getting it? You knew there are better things that will last forever. This is all just temporary. You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. Better things are there. Now, if we continue where we left off, Hebrews 10.35. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. A key. Then you will receive all that he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destructions. destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. Keep that on the screen because here's the thing. Verses 37 and 38 are a quote of Habakkuk 2, verses 3 through 4. Amazing. Patient endurance is what we need now so that we can do the Lord's will, which is to love. And a lot of people don't realize patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Right? So if you're in Galatians 5 and you're reading, you're going to see the fruit of the flesh, outbursts of anger. It's not from God. But then he goes through the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, godliness, faithfulness, self-control. Did you notice the patience in there? Love, joy, peace, patience. If you're patient, it's a fruit of the Spirit, showing that you have the Holy Spirit in you. You're empowered to wait sometimes. And it's a seal of our salvation. Popular chapter. Even if you don't read the Bible a lot, you've been to a wedding, you've heard this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love isn't boastful or jealous. But what, what is it? It's the first thing that Holy Spirit brings to Paul's mind, right, as it's being written or penned by Tertius. So love is patient. Love is patient. Think about it. We are to endure through these trials, Romans 5. Even in trials, we are to endure because this endurance is going to build up our character. Right? And it's going to lead to hope, a hope that will not disappoint. We are sealed with the Spirit of God. That's who we should be listening to all the time. And so let me pray for you. Lord, I thank everyone in the sound of my voice for tuning in or coming in. Lord, I pray you give them the strength, fill them with the power of your Spirit to not only bless those who might be persecuting them, but also to be vehicles of your love, and to remain strengthful, strength and endurance to maintain that strength through even the worst of trials. The worst of trials. Fill them with joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. Remind them of what awaits them in heaven beyond what is here. 
I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.